Well, many people have asked us if we enjoyed our holiday. How could we not enjoy sitting back, doing nothing, being fed, even having the bed made for us? That's pretty cool. Uh, the only thing that uh, was a downfall was that Dawn had to do her own washing. And mine, of course. <laughs> but it was all cool. It was great. and We really loved it. We had a very relaxing time. And I have to say, though, that on the boat, the average age was 75. Average age was 75. You know, so there were more Zimmer frames gunning for position down the corridors than you can imagine. And, and you know, the, the lovely old ladies had their arms out as well, you know, just making sure you didn't get past them. Because <laughs> if you were rushing to a show or something, you know, they wanted their seat as well. It was, it was great. It was really awesome. You know, there was... Um, there was plenty of room on the deck chairs up on the upper decks because they couldn't get up there. <laughs> but there was absolutely no chance of getting a lift. You basically had to walk up and down like it's 12 storeys, the, the boat. So, you know, you can imagine walking up and down that often. So we ate a lot, but we lost a lot as well. I think I ate a bit more than I lost, but anyway. <laughs> so, um, you know... Um, I called the cruise myself close to God, the close to God cruise. <laughs> um, and sadly, when we landed at Lombok, an elderly gentleman slipped over in the street and banged his head in the gutter and uh, he died a day later in Perth. They helicoptered him to Perth, but he, 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 didn't, uh, he didn't live. And uh, later another man went over to the side and we never saw him again. And then just before the cruise ended, I know at least one other woman died of natural causes before we landed at Sydney. So, you know, it was a great time of relaxing, but there was also, you know, the, the prospect of death. And the first point I want to make this morning is death is our reality, but we shouldn't be scared of death. Um, you know, no height nor depth. You know, we can be soaring in the heights, so happy, so nothing can separate us from God, or we can be down in the depths, we can be dead. And nothing can separate us from God. Nothing. And uh, then, of course, um, Beck announced last week that her own dear sister, Rita, super grand, I used to call her, and uh, um, she died peacefully in Perth a week and a bit ago. See, death is all around us. So how do we cope? How do you cope with death? What do you think about uh, when you hear about death or dying? Hmm. Many people uh, really fear death. It even controls their lives, while others see that it's just a sweet release to be with Jesus and to be with God. Uh, recently, Dawn and I counselled a young woman, I'm saying a young woman, uh, who was so afraid of dying, she had panic attacks. She, she couldn't function at all when they came on her, and sometimes she couldn't even speak. She just had to sit there and just let it pass. What an awful situation to be in, and that's robbery. So where do you sit on this whole thing of death? Does death frighten you? Um, if it does, I want to show you from God's word that you have nothing to fear from death. Absolutely nothing to fear from death. And uh, uh, death has been destroyed. Paul uh, says to the Christians, and I say the Christians at, at Corinth, listen to this secret truth, um, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 55 and following. We shall not all die, but when the last trumpet sound, we shall all be changed in an instant as quickly as bl uh, the blinking of an eye. For when the trumpet sounds, the dead will be raised never to die again. The dead will be raised never to die again. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. Hallelujah. I want to be on that train. I want to be on that train. And we shall be changed. Um, for what is mortal must be changed into what is immortal. And what will die must be changed into what cannot die. Not may not die or, you know, 50% may not die. What cannot die? You know, the positive. It cannot die. Our bodies will be made into something that cannot die in that point when we are raised to life. So then this takes place and the mortal has been changed into the immortal. Then the scripture will be true. Death is destroyed. Um, victory is complete. Where death is your victory. Where death is your power to hurt. And he goes on in verse 56 and he says, Death gets its power to hurt from sin, and sin gets its power to hurt from the law. Okay? 
But thanks be to God who gave us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, dear friends, stand firm and steady. Keep busy always in your work for the Lord, since you know that nothing you do in the Lord's service is ever useless. So Paul's instructing us not to worry about death. This body that sins occasionally um, will be changed and um, uh, it'll be made perfect and whole and uh, delivered to Jesus. Um, Jesus died so we could be resurrected and have eternal life. You know, Paul was quoting the prophet Hosea uh, when he says that God has done all things um, uh, in his hands for those who, I'm um, sorry, God has all things in hand for those who love him and serve him. You know, remember David wrote in the Psalm 23, that's uh, one off, most often used at funerals, um, and he uses the image of sheep in the care of a shepherd and he celebrates the security uh, of being in God's protection. Of course, in the, in the Middle East, um, in uh, Jesus' time, sheep were a precious symbol of wealth. They provided yarn for clothing. Um, um, they also used them for sacrifice and also used them for food. And yet sheep are dependent creatures. They must be guided to food and water and protected from wild animals. Sheep cannot survive alone in the wild, but must always be in the company of a shepherd. And David understood this when he penned this psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. God uh, creates in us a righteousness that we cannot create of our own. Not for our sake, but for his sake. So that we can communicate with him. So that as we praise him in the service, we minister to him. And God receives that praise. And he's blessed. Did you think you could bless God? Well, you can bless God when you praise him with all your heart. Yes, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, those things that would protect the sheep, um, they comfort me. We know that God has a big stick for anyone who's coming after us. Not for us. The devil told us God's got a big stick and every time we do something wrong, he belts us with it, right? No. He belts the enemy with it. See, the shepherd of that day loved their sheep. They gave each one a name. Can you imagine naming 200 sheep and knowing who they were? Well, they did. And God knows the billions of people in the world. He knows your name. He knows how many hairs are on your head or not on your head or how they're decreasing. He knows that. So if you've got a God like that, you know, who's going to stand against you? Who's going to come against you? The world tells us a very different story, but the Bible tells us the truth. You know, um, they position themselves between the wild beast and, and, and the sheep. Um, remember David who fought off and killed the lion and the bear that came after his sheep. At night the shepherd lay down um, in the gap of the sheepfold. So anything that wanted to get to the sheep had to come through him. See, anything that you're experiencing, it, it's trying to get through past God in a negative sense. Okay, It's trying to get past God, but he is there. He's filtering it. You know, David paints an incredible picture of us as sheep and God as our shepherd, the one who loves and protects us and calls us by name. So he leads us, he protects us, and because he's always with us, we fear no evil. You know, every time I used to, when I used to walk out in the dark, I'd get this chill down my back and I'd fear evil. Okay? I don't know if you've ever had that experience. You walk out in the dark by yourself and... <laughs> yeah, Okay? But don't do that now. If the devil tries to put that on me now, I just say, Nick, off. My God is with me. I've got an angel behind me, appointed by God from the day of my birth. I have protection. The 
The second picture we have here is of God as a loving host. Um, we're like guests in the house of God who, are very, uh, who is a very generous host. Um, verse 5, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen? Amen. That's our prayer. You know, the last two verses give us that picture of guests eating in the home of a generous host. It's a bit like that in Africa. You know, if you go to someone's home, they will just spoil you, really spoil you. Um, You know, if you come to our place, they'll say, well, help yourself. No, there they spoil you. They really look up. It doesn't matter who, who you are. If you go to someone's house for a meal, you'll be really looked after. And it's the same in the Middle East. Um, Hospitality is valued very highly. Uh, The needs of a guest were gladly supplied, even if it meant the host family had to go without. It was the price that they were prepared to pay. And, you know, Jesus died on the cross, as we've sung this morning, for you and for me, for our salvation. And there was a great cost in our salvation and Jesus was willing to pay the price. God himself set a table before David and he treated him generously as his guest because David um, is under God's protection. He is sure that goodness and love will follow him all the days of his life. And it's the same for us. We're under God's protection. Uh, We can be sure that goodness and love will follow us all the days of our life. Christ lived his life on earth as a human being. And in human form, he was a sheep just like us, with one difference. One difference. He obeyed and followed the Lord um, uh, in everything. He sought to do the Father's will. He followed that. And God raised him from the dead and he became our good shepherd. He became your good shepherd. And as Tanya Harris spoke a few weeks ago, probably a month ago now, Uh, we need to be able to hear his voice because he says, my sheep, hear my voice. And so we want to be hearing his voice. You know, as prophecy, and I'm not going to read Psalm 22, but as prophecy, Psalm 23 reminds us that though Jesus walked in the valley of the shadow of death and experienced the turmoil that's described in in, um, Psalm 22, he was upheld by God's protective love and uh, You know, I'll just read some of the verses. Um, You'll know them from the crucifixion scene. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Eli, Eli, lala, bak, sami. Why have you abandoned me? That's how Jesus felt. I have cried desperately for your help, but still it does not come. But you are the enthroned as the Holy One whom Israel praises. But I am no longer human. I am a worm despised and scorned by everyone. All who see me make fun of me. They stick their tongue out and shake their head. And he goes on to talk about how God protected him when he was young through dreams, mind you. He, he told of his birth through dreams and visions. He, he protected him through dreams and visions. He got him out of Egypt, got him into Egypt, got him out of Egypt. Um, just incredible how God is relentless to speak to us if we'll listen, if we'll hear. Then in verse 14, he says, My strength is gone like water spilled out on the ground. It's a really great picture, isn't it? My strength is gone like water pointed out on the ground. Well, it was sandy ground, so it just went straight in. Empty, running on nothing. Praise God, he is good. Verse 17, All my bones can be seen. My enemy look at me and stare. They gamble for my clothes and divide them amongst themselves. You know, this was said hundreds of years before Jesus was born. God was saying, I'm sending a saviour, I'm bringing a saviour. And bless God, Sam's here. Hallelujah. (laughs) Lord, don't stay away from me. Come quickly to my rescue. I will tell my people what you have done. I will praise them in your assembly. And uh, I'll go right down. The Lord is king and he rules the nations. People not yet born will be told the Lord saves his people. See, David had that assurance and we can have that same assurance in our hearts no matter what happens, whether in life or in death, the Lord saves his people. The Lord saves his people. Um, 
Thirdly, dreams warn us of spiritual death. And uh, we need to be careful of spiritual death. I, re- I remember when I was a young Christian, probably only a year or two in, into the faith, and uh, a guy called Randy Matthews sang a song, Wish We'd All Been Ready. You know, um, It was about end times and those who refused to believe in Jesus and follow behind him um, were actually left behind. And the, the chorus went something like, oh, I'm not going to sing it, There's no time to change your mind. The sun has come and you've been left behind. Um, just, yeah. A- a- and um, I-, I remember waking up one night in a cold sweat and I'd, I'd had the dream uh, that I saw the massive gates come crashing closed. And it sounded like that and it woke me up. And I felt isolated, I felt alone. And, and even in my spirit then, that you know, I was saved but I wasn't filled with the spirit yet. Um, even that shuddered and I thought, I've been left behind. It was so real. It was so real. And as Beck said last week, um, God grants us repentance and uh, we can come to know Jesus. Um, and he, but he grants us repentance because we're weak. Um, we're not really wanting to listen to him and obey him. Um, but he won't allow us to continue in a lifestyle of sin and rebellion without warning us. So he, he was warning us and our spirits uh, regenerated to help us become more and more like Jesus, not be the same, same old person I was before. We're regenerated so that we become more like Jesus. The, th- the things of the past drop off and the new things of the spirit come in. We start to hear God and obey him more readily and more clearly. See, here, I, here it is. I, you know, as an evangelical Christian, I thought God only spoke to us through Jesus, who is his word revealed. And, uh, you know, Hebrews 1, I could quote it. In the past, God spoke it, um, to our ancestors uh, many times and many ways through the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us through his son. And I read the word and I knew about the word, but I didn't always obey what I knew. I don't know if that's you. <laughs> I didn't always obey what I knew. See, in, in the Greek, if you're not doing it, you don't know it. Okay, do you get that? You can't, you can't say, um, you know, um, you know something unless you're actually doing it. That's the, that's the reality of uh, the Greek, which doesn't come across in English. See, Father God wants us to spend eternity with him. And we do whatever it takes. Um, and he will do whatever it takes to point us to him. And Job 33, verses 14 and following, it says, Although God speaks again and again, no one pays attention to what he says. We all know what he says, but it's talking about paying attention. Paying attention means a changed life. Paying attention means not being religious about it, but but saying, God, you've done this for me. What can I do for you? Do you have a plan for my life? I'm happy to do whatever you want me to do. And you know, that was me. Um, Wanting with all my heart to obey everything I knew about God, a kind of emotional response. But I hadn't truly received the revelation of how to align my will with God's will. Okay? That's what we've got to do. Align our will with God's will. And then things will work out for us. Uh, When God wants uh, to get our attention, what does he do? So let's read on in verse 15. At night when people are sleeping, God speaks in dreams and visions. He makes them listen to what he says and they are frightened at his warning. I can tell you, I was frightened at that dream and I needed to be frightened. I needed to have the fear of God um, about the reality of the life I was walking compared to um, what I would have liked to have walked. And, um, you know, I just thank God for that dream. I didn't realise the the true significance of it until um, this week. Okay, I did surrender my life more and more to Jesus and, and, and move forward. So where do we get to? Verse 17, God speaks to make them stop their sinning and to save them from becoming proud. You know, we can, we can also become proud um, like the Pharisees who were proud of doing the religious things, but they were awful people. 
They do all the religious stuff and they think, okay, whew, now I'm saved and going to heaven. I've got a relationship with God because that's what the law says. And uh, they did what the law says, but they were going to hell just the same. Oh, isn't God awful? Isn't God awful? Tells people to do stuff and when they do it, they go to hell for it. Okay? Why is that? Why is that? God speaks to make them stop their sinning and to save them from becoming proud. That's right. Proud. I'm proud of what I'm doing. I'm proud of that. But it should be, it's no longer I that do it, but Christ who, uh, who dwells in me. I'm doing it that way. Okay, so um, God wants to warn us. He wants us to know that there's a reality and, um, and if we respond to him, he will not let them be destroyed. He saves them from death itself. That's what it goes on to say. And I want to be in that place because if I die before Jesus comes back, I want to be in that place where the minute he appears, poof, out of the grave I pop. Spirit with a new spiritual body, probably more masculine than this one. I look like a pudding. <laughs> anyway, I'm just, yeah, God is so good. And, and I believe that um, to, at that time God was warning me through that dream to man up, to live the faithful life that he provided. I'm saying he provided. I'm not creating a life that, that um, uh, will make me righteous. Um, it's a life that he provided. You know, I just say if God is for us, who can be against us? No one can be. If your life and mine has God-given purpose, who can derail that? Can the devil? No. People say, oh, the devil made me do it. That's why I'm not in any ministry anymore. No, you did it. The choices you make, okay? So for a time, well, always, but for a time God will allow us to be in habitual sin. Very short time. And then he wants us to deal with it step by step. And sometimes it'll come back on us. Sometimes we've just got to keep fighting. You know, it, it's, it's really a serious thing because um, we've got to get to this stage where Paul is. So to live that kind of life, um, we have to die to self and become alive to Jesus Christ. Die to self, what does that mean? Well, I'm not going to tell you you've got to look up for yourself. But uh, I will share this verse. We not only die to self, but we come alive to Jesus Christ. Paul said in Philippians 3.10, I no longer have a righteousness of my own, the kind that was gained by obeying the law. I now have a righteousness that was given to me through faith in Christ. That's where our righteousness comes from, not from doing good works. God wants us to do good works, but if we do it for the sake of doing good works will become proud about it. Aren't I a good person? You know, I won't go there. I've probably said that myself. <laughs> Verse 10. All I want to know, oh, sorry, all I want is to know Christ and experience his power and resurrection, to share his sufferings, become like him in his death, so that I myself will be raised from death to life. So I hope I'm not shocking you here when I tell you that everyone must die once and after that comes judgment. In the same manner Christ was offered in sacrifice, Hebrews 9.27 says, um, once to take away the sins of many, he will appear a second time, not to deal with sin because that's already dealt with, okay? But he'll come for those who are waiting for him. And I hope your heart and your life shows that you're waiting for him, Okay? Because if your, your life and your heart shows that you're waiting for him, you will not have to fear death. You will not have to fear death. death. Death is coming to each one of us. We don't have to worry about it or be afraid of it. God saves us from death itself. That's what the word has said about three times so far. God saves us um, from death itself. I mentioned these three causes of death um, in my introduction, accidental, suicide, natural. 
You know, death is death, and when we're dead, uh, we will all have to give an account to God. Um, we will all have to say what we did with the gift and the calling God put on our life. He will ask us, what did you do with it? And we need to have an answer. And what's our answer? I depend on Jesus Christ. I have nothing else. There is no one else and get, that can get me through. And then God, uh, who is um, Jesus, will you know, hand out the rewards. We don't work for rewards, but there will be rewards. God is so good. So I was telling this, the story of, of the cruise last week to a guy who I've known for oh, quite a long time, and his comment was, well, you never know when your time is up, do you? And I said, no, you don't, but you know, it's really important that we're ready. And I didn't say that with any force. I just said, oh, yeah, it's really important that we're ready. And, and I saw that phrase hit him like a ton of bricks. He was taken aback. His countenance has changed, and he said to me, he leaned over to me, and he said, yes, you're right. See, that was a God moment. God's doing something in his life and we've now been invited to go up there for tea. Amen. Isn't that weird? <laughs> Not weird, it's God. Amen. So as Christians in this life, we die twice. We all agree we die twice? Okay. Uh, once to ourselves and become alive to Christ and the second time we die naturally to wait Jesus' return for his church. So the dead in Christ will be raised instantly, the moment he appears with all his angels. So if we don't follow Jesus and serve him in this life, we also die twice. That's weird, isn't it? First, we die a natural death. And secondly, because um, we're not waiting for Jesus to, uh, to resurrect us and save us, we die the second death, which is called the spiritual death. And that kind of death, we really don't want to die. Because, you know, as we, as we, um, someone explained it as the battery running out, you know, you're chugging along in your car and it, and it dies and you try to start it, and um, it doesn't start, you just get out of the car and you start walking, don't you? You know, you've got to get somewhere. Uh, well, that's what happens to us in the resurrection. Um, but, you know, our reality kind of doesn't, well, it does change. Our reality changes, but we're still on the track to receiving Jesus when he comes back. And, you know, our spiritual life forever. Guess what happens to those who go to hell? Are they just, are they just dead? No, they're alive forever. It, it makes me want to cry. The people I know are going to go to that place because they're too proud to humble themselves before the Son of God who died for them, who paid the price. You know, that kind of death we need to be afraid of. We really need to be afraid of. You know, so if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Saviour, and I say Lord because Lord means you surrender everything and you do what he tells you. Um, I'd like to give you an opportunity this morning. And you can pray this prayer with me if you like. But I really would like you to come and tell me that you've done that afterwards so I can give you some, uh, some material to follow up and uh, learn how to follow Jesus. So Father, we thank you that you deliver all those who come into relationship with your son. You save them. You restore their soul. You lift them up to be with you in the heavenly realms. We thank you for that. And Lord, we just, uh, any who might know you, we just surrender to you this morning. We thank you as we come in repentance and ask you to forgive our sins, you do. They're as far as the east is to the west, never seen into all eternity. So Lord, we just uh, either commit our lives to you for the first time or we recommit our lives to you. We ask you, Lord, to 
bring that change into our hearts, into our spirits. Give us the revelation that we need today. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So if you prayed that prayer, I'd love you to come and say, I prayed that prayer. Have you got something for me? And I'll say, yes, I have. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, we might say grace. And oh, yeah, we might just show the song. Oh, that'd be good. Thank you. We have a song to finish off with. It's for the young ones. And the young at heart. It's called Forgive Me. Food for thought. Father, we, we just thank you um, for your word. We thank you uh, for all that um, you've done in our lives. We ask you to bless this food that we're about to partake of, that you bless our fellowship, Lord. And um, Lord, we just uh, thank each leader uh, who's taken part this year. And uh, let's celebrate.